Hello and welcome to Contact in the Desert. My name is Manu Saifzadeh and today I will tell you about the hieroglyphic evidence for the real Hall of Records. Now, when I got into this research about four years ago, I had no idea I would end up in this place. Uh, originally, I was interested in the debate on the age of the Great Sphinx. And of course, that debate is over 100 years old. So what could I contribute to the discussion? But that's how research goes. You stumble over some evidence. Other people may have looked at it, but maybe interpreted it in a different light. And so that's kind of how I got involved gradually. But after all this time, even if you had just asked me two years ago that this would lead me to the Hall of Records eventually, I would have said that's impossible, but here I am. I think uh, there are two main things that I want you to take away from this talk. The first thing is that in order to be able to re-establish the correct line of history, you have to have a name. You have to have a name to be written into the records of history. And that is one of the essential problems, I thought, when I looked at the debate about the Great Sphinx, because there really was not a name, there was no written record that referred to this monument prior to the time that Egyptologists are telling us that uh, she was created. And the other thing I want to tell you is that you have to go with the evidence. Uh, you cannot be, or you try to minimize the amount of bias, the amount of preconceived notions that may drive you to think of things in a certain way. No, you have to follow the evidence and be as honest as you can about um, using just the evidence to create the models and the theories that uh, come from it and not the other way around. So I hope at the end that that's what I have been able to do. You are ultimately the judge. I will put the evidence in front of you today. This talk takes about an hour and 15 minutes and afterwards uh, I'll be available for, for your questions. I hope you enjoy the talk. I know that uh, because of the circumstances we cannot be together in a physical place and that's too bad, but I will try to make it up to you by making this uh, into a lively presentation and I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you for your attendance. The Great Sphinx has mystified people for thousands of years, but the debate about the age of the Great Sphinx really in modern times begins at the turn of the 20th century. At that point, a German Egyptologist by the name of Ludwig Borchardt looked at the headdress of the Great Sphinx, and what you see here is a pleated cloth called anemis. And because at the time only statues from the Middle Kingdom were known that had this type of headdress, Borchardt concluded that the Sphinx must have been made in the Middle Kingdom. There was one statue of Khafre, but Borja thought that this was a copy made later and that this was not a true reflection of uh, the headdress uh, worn in, by kings in the Old Kingdom. And so at that time, a, an American Egyptologist by the name of George Reisner uh, obtained a permit to excavate large parts of Giza, including the temples of the Menkora Pyramid. And George Reisner found what he, think, what he thought was the crucial piece of evidence. And based on that, he pronounced to the world that we now know why and by whom it was made. Well, what is it that Reisner found? He turns out um, then concluded that it had to be Khafre that built the Great Sphinx. And that was based on a statue of Menkora that he found in situ at the Pyramid Temple. And now this was a piece of evidence that he could comfortably date to the Old Kingdom. And there you can see the headdress of the king wearing exactly the same nemesis as the Great Sphinx. And because the Great Sphinx was in front of the Pyramid of Khafre, Reisner concluded that it had to be this king that must have made the Great Sphinx. And this is really how the narrative that still extends to today about who made the Great Sphinx got started. And this conclusion by George Reisner over a hundred years ago really forms the foundation of the current historical narrative about the Great Sphinx, when it was created and who made it. Of course, on the way, there have been uh, new surveys, new evidence has come to light that uh, supports this viewpoint, and I'm going to get into that in a few moments. But I want to show you here 
some evidence that you may not be aware of that puts this narrative into doubt. So this is best uh, explained from an unusual view that most people don't get to see when they go to Egypt. This is higher up uh, on a hill called Jebel Ghibli. And when you look at the Sphinx from this side, from the southern side, that is, you see the Valley Temple of Khafre. The Sphinx Temple is hidden behind the Valley Temple. We can't see it from this angle. Here's a newer temple from the New Kingdom made by Amenhotep II. And then here we have this unnaturally extended body of the Sphinx, the Great Sphinx, with uh, a head that's disproportionately small. Egyptologists have offered two explanations to explain this disproportionate statue. The first idea is that the statue was meant to be seen from the front, and when you look at it from the front, it in fact does look more proportionate. The other explanation offered is that there is a geological defect that runs through the rock at this point, which cuts through both the monument and the Sphinx ditch. And it is because of this geological defect called the major fissure that the, the builders had to extend the body in order to be able to make a curved rump with tail. And they would not have been able to do that from the uh, more straight cutoff that the fissure created. But now what I want you to do is to keep this perspective of the Great Sphinx in mind for a few moments. And now I'm going to show you an image that dates from four to 500 years before the time of Khafre, before the time of the Old Kingdom, and before the time that Egyptologists are saying that the Great Sphinx was created. This is a wooden tablet that was found by Flinders Petrie around 1900 in the tomb of Horus Jair, the third king of Egypt, dated to about uh, four or five hundred years prior to Khafre. To just give you an idea when this was discovered, this is almost exactly the same time as when Ludwig Borchardt announced his theory that he thought that the Great Sphinx came from the Middle Kingdom. This was before George Reisner found the statue of Menkora from which he concluded that the Great Sphinx was an Old Kingdom statue. But here now we have a piece of evidence that dates to four, even 500 years perhaps, prior to the reign of Khafre. And what do we see is a, a building, almost square-like. There's three figurines inside. And in my book, Under the Sphinx, I explain what these three figurines are. But what we see in front of this building is a somewhat unnaturally elongated body of what looks like a lion. And since this body appears to be about comparable to the size of this building, this looks like a giant statue of a lion. And so what I would propose is that we are looking, in fact, at something that an ancient tourist may have seen if he or she had gone to Giza in, in early dynastic times when Egyptologists are telling us there was nothing there except for just wilderness and rock. And I think that this is what they would in fact have seen. And that is from the same perspective that um, I just showed you in the previous photo that you would have seen now with the Great Sphinx and the temples in front of it when you are tourists taking a photo of the area from Jebel Ghibli. When we go forward in time to the late period, antiquity, and even all the way to modern times, and look how artists have depicted sphinxes, you might think that the myth of the sphinx has taken the idea now so far away uh, from the original idea that there is no further connection between the true origins and the sphinxes in those more modern times. But there are some interesting elements that I want to show you. Uh, that suggests that this may not be the case. There is, in fact, a connection to the true origin of the Great Sphinx. So what we see here in this relatively recent painting is a scene from Oedipus Rex, that this Sphinx has the body of a lion. There is a, a hip chain that even reminds you a little bit of the major fissure I just mentioned. There's something coming out of the back of the Sphinx. In this case, it's wings. But the most important thing is that this is a female Sphinx. It's a she. Now I'm going to show you an image that predates the Great Sphinx. And you will be surprised to see that some of the elements are present in this image. So for example, here is something that I'm going to talk about today. This image predates the Great Sphinx. It is 
a couch and lion. It has something coming out of its back, just like the more modern Sphinx. But in this case, it's an object that uh, defies explanation. This Sphinx has a, a neck ornament, just like the other Sphinx has something around the hip. And in fact, in this case also, we don't have a male lion, we have a female lion, a lioness. And so this is a uh, part of a big part of the take home today, which is that before the Great Sphinx, she was a prehistoric lioness statue. Let me orient you to space and time. The ancient land of Egypt was really that part of Northeast Africa defined by the River Nile. This being the Delta as the river emptied into the Mediterranean Sea. This is the Red Sea, the Black Sea here. This is Asia Minor, Arabia. And the ancient land of Sumer was in this area here. And this is the Giza Plateau. Of course, Giza is a modern name. In ancient times, this was called Rostau. The three pyramids are attributed to Khufu, his son Khafre, and his grandson Menkore. There was also a king by the name of Jedefre who came right after Khufu, and Jedefre's pyramid is further to the north at Abu Rowash. And here is the Great Sphinx. This is a timeline of Egyptian history that spans some 3,000 years, and there's still 2,000 years to go to come to our times. But just to get oriented, here is the time of Jesus. This is the time of Muhammad over here, the time of Moses and the Exodus. And some researchers believe that this was a little bit earlier during the Middle Kingdom. But the Great Sphinx, according to Egyptologists, was made sometime in this time frame, in the Old Kingdom, specifically in the Fourth Dynasty. Alternative historians, however, think that this was much earlier, more like 10,000 BC. This is a good place for me to contrast the two opposing theories about the age of the Great Sphinx. On the one hand, we have the orthodox narrative, which really, as I mentioned, begins with George Reisner's model that the Great Sphinx was made by Khafre sometime during the 4th dynasty around 26th century BC, that the Sphinx was made from the same stone as the Valley and Sphinx Temple, meaning that all of these three structures were made at the same time, and that those three structures were part of an even larger complex that included also the causeway, the Pyramid Temple, and the Pyramid of Khafre. The alternative historians, um, on the other hand, think that the Great Sphinx was made, was made much earlier, sometime around 10,000 BC, and it was only remodeled by Khafre in the 26th century BC. The alternative historians agree, actually, with uh, the orthodox narrative that the Sphinx was made from the same stone as the Valley and Sphinx Temple, and that all of these structures were made at the same time. But they hold that uh, Khafre only refurbished and remodeled these temples by adding a coat of granite. In addition to that, um, alternative historians also agree that the temples and the Sphinx were indeed part of a master plan solar complex, but that complex did not include the Pyramid of Khafre, which did not exist in prehistoric times. I think it's always a good idea to know what you're up against especially when you're arguing against a mainstream view. And so I want to spend a little bit of time to explain the evidence on which Egyptologists base the mainstream narrative. I haven't done the survey yet, but I think if you ask most Egyptologists uh, who made the Great Sphinx, I think what they would say is it was one of these three kings from the fourth dynasty of the Old Kingdom either Khufu or one of his two sons, Khafre or Jedefre. Given those three choices, the majority of them will say that it was Khafre who built the Great Sphinx, just like what George Reisner concluded uh, in uh, 1912. 
And that in part is also because they say that the face of Khafre is really the face of the Great Sphinx. However, there is a minority of Egyptologists that think that it could have been Khufu's face, and there's even some that think it may have been Jennifer's face. But it gets a little bit more complicated than that because um, one minority view held by, for example, Vasily Dobrev is that it was Jennifer who built the Great Sphinx to honor his father, and that's why he put his father's face on the monument. Another minority view was held by Reiner Stadelmann, the former chief of the German Archaeological Institute at Cairo. Stadelmann thought that it was Khufu who built the Great Sphinx, and if that's the case, then the face carved into the Great Sphinx, perhaps, is that of Khufu himself or maybe his mother. There are three lines of evidence Egyptologists offer in support of the mainstream model that the Great Sphinx was made by Khafre. And so the first line of evidence has to do with the overall connectedness of the monuments and their relationship to the Khafre pyramid. The second line of evidence has to do with inscriptions that were found in granite here around the Valley Temple, statues that were found by Khafre inside the Valley Temple, and an inscription on the Dream Stella between the forepaws of the Great Sphinx. And the third piece of evidence has to do with debris from the Old Kingdom that was found right here in the Sphinx quarry. So I just want to spend a little bit of time of explaining these three lines of evidence. The logic of the first line of evidence is that if you can link these monuments, then dating any one of them will date the entire complex. And that is what Egyptologists are saying is possible because they have, in fact, been able to not only link these monuments, but even define the building sequence. And so what they're saying is uh, that the mortuary temple, which is very similar to the Sphinx Temple in its layout, in its geometry, is really um, a con con was really constructed before the Causeway and the Valley Temple, and that was constructed before the Sphinx and the Sphinx Temple. In fact, they're saying that the workers at the end walked off the building site when the king died, and that is why there is a corner here in the northwest um, part of the Sphinx Temple that hasn't been finished yet. In addition to that, the outside of the Sphinx temple, temple was never coated with granite. And so in addition to the connectedness, there's even this temporal sequence that Egyptologists are holding up as proof that the Sphinx cannot be thought of in isolation, that in fact it has to be viewed as integrated into this entire complex. And the fact that this entire complex is given its meaning, meaning a solar context by virtue of Khafre's pyramid is the dating that is what they need in order to be able to date this entire complex, including the Great Sphinx. The second line of evidence has to do with inscriptions. And I already mentioned that uh, the name of Khafre was inscribed on some of the granite blocks that were used to coat the Valley Temple, and there were statues of Khafre, of course, found inside the Valley Temple. In addition to that, there is also an inscription on the Dream Stella, which is a stone plate left between the four paws of the Great Sphinx about 1100 years after the Old Kingdom. The Dream Stella tells the story of King Tutmos IV, who came hunting at Giza, and after a long day in the sun, he fell asleep under the Great Sphinx. In his dream, the statue started to speak with him and ask him to free him from the sands, and in return, she would give him the crown of Egypt. And that is exactly what Tutmos did. Not only that, he also built an enclosure wall around the entire complex. When you look to the left lower corner of the Dream Stella, what's left of it anyways, there is a small fragment of a cartouche which once contained the name of a king. In the reconstruction, this may have indeed been the name of Khafre, although there's no assurance that this is the case. 
Next to the name of the king, we can see the word tut for image. Here, the I symbol means made. The water line means for. This is atum, and this is hor machet, the name of the great sphinx. So there seems to be some kind of connection here between the name of the king, the image of the king, being made for atum hor machet. The problem, of course, is that we don't know the rest of the inscription. There may have been other king names that had some involvement. And so this isn't compelling proof that Kafre is the one who made the Sphinx. It only gives us an idea that Kafre, if that is in fact the name of Kafre, had some involvement with the Great Sphinx, at least in the view of Tatmos IV, who is the one who left the stone plate between the forepaws of the Sphinx. Let me now talk about the chief evidence. This is the third line of evidence. That is probably the most compelling evidence that Egyptologists currently have to date the Great Sphinx. This has to do with some debris that was found in this location over here. So let me just orient you real quick. This is the Sphinx Temple. We're looking from the east towards the west, towards the Great Sphinx. Here is the Temple of Amenhotep II. And it turns out that the temple was partially built over a pile of rubble. And when Mark Lehner and his team surveyed the Great Sphinx in the 1980s, they found stone blocks under this pile of rubble that were, according to them, meant to be incorporated into the Sphinx Temple. Remember, they believed that the Sphinx Temple was not completed by the builders. They basically walked off the site. And so, the blocks that were meant to be incorporated into this corner were just left. And what they found under those two blocks was old kingdom debris, meaning potsherds, charcoal from fires, and some other artifacts. And based on that, Mark Lehner concluded that the blocks could not have been older than the old kingdom because they were lying on top of this trash, this debris. The other part of this line of evidence is that Mark Lehner found depressions here on this ridge. This, remember, was a quarry from which blocks were cut to build the temples here. And on the ridge, he found depressions that were filled with mud and sand. And when he removed the sand and the mud, he found, again, artifacts that dated to the Old Kingdom, even a copper chisel, a mallet, and some other items. And so based on this combined evidence now, and based on the fact that the monuments were built in a certain sequence with the Sphinx Temple at the end, Egyptologists feel pretty confident that they can now date the entire complex to the Old Kingdom. Many of you are probably familiar with the alternative historian's view and the evidence that supports it, but I want to spend a little bit of time on some of these details as well, because some of them you might not know. The alternative history model of the Great Sphinx goes something like this. Prehistoric people who came to this area, the area that is now called Giza, sometime around 10,000 BC, saw an outcropping of the limestone rock that may have reminded them of the, the head of an animal or the head of a person or a king or a god, and that inspired them to build a monument. In addition to the statue, the prehistoric builders also made three temples and a causeway. And remember what I said before, there's really no disagreement between the Orthodox camp and the alternative historians as to whether or not these structures were built together. They were. The only disagreement is when that happened. Now, in terms of uh, why the complex was built, in the alternative historian view, it had to do with astronomy as well. Of course, the monument itself, the statue that is, points at due east, and that, astronomically speaking, most likely had to do with the sunrise on the vernal equinox. But what about the direction of the causeway? Well, this is something that Robert Bouval analyzed and what Robert came up with is that in fact it has to do with a certain date. 
What Robert concluded is that the causeway is pointing to an area in horizon where the sun rises 121 days after the summer solstice. And this was an important date as told to us in the Temple of Horus at Edfu, because that is the day when the forces of good defeated the forces of evil. Here are some screenshots from the film Mystery of the Sphinx. This aired for the first time in 1993. And in this documentary, John Anthony West and Robert Schock formulated their alternative model of how the Great Sphinx originated. What the researchers proposed is that the original statue was maybe that of a male lion. They also considered maybe a king or a queen or the statue of a god. Regardless, what they said is that this was the original statue and only much later did Khafre remodel the statue into the Great Sphinx. And this remodeling job explains the disproportionate Great Sphinx. The other thing that the researchers proposed is that it was heavy rain and water runoff that eroded the Great Sphinx into what we see today. And this rain damage, this water damage, changed the rock in different ways than you would expect from wind and sand, which causes mostly horizontal erosion. But the water damage caused this sort of candle wax, candle wax effect, these vertical and oblique fissures that degraded the rock in this fashion. And that explained to them this older age of the monument, how this damage came to be. Here, for example, is a lion statue that is not as old as the Great Sphinx. This is perhaps 2,300 years old, uh, possibly made by Alexander the Great for his friend Hephaestion. And this stone lion has experienced rainfall. And as you can see, the contours of the statue have eroded. And so this is the kind of effect, the candle wax effect I just mentioned, that has also affected the Great Sphinx. But so you might wonder, when did all this rain fall in Northeast Africa? Well, it turns out that there was, in fact, a time for about 4,000 years prior to the ancient Egyptian civilization when that kind of rain fell. And the theory, uh, according to uh, John Anthony West and Robert Schock, is that the original monument, the, the Lion Monument, was bombarded by rain for this entire period. And that explains the water damage. And you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't expect to see something like that on the Sphinx and the wall around the Sphinx if the monument had originated at this time period when this rainy period had already passed. There's really no other place in Egypt, certainly not on the Giza Plateau, where you can see this type of water-induced damage that makes the rock melt like candle wax. Remember that uh, the Great Sphinx was probably refurbished and remodeled, and so that damage may have been ground away, sanded away. But on the walls around the Great Sphinx, that damage is still visible. And that is exactly what Robert Schock noticed when he walked up and he immediately realized that there's something wrong with the mainstream narrative of how old this entire complex is. And so it is this kind of damage that formed the basis for the so-called water erosion hypothesis, which is what uh, Robert Schock and John Anthony West used as one part of their argument that the, the true age of the Great Sphinx is much older than the Old Kingdom of ancient Egypt. And to prove this point, Robert Schock pointed out that uh, other monuments that were cut from the rock at Giza, here for example, the tomb of Debehen in the central field, were not eroded like the, the Sphinx and the, especially the enclosure wall around the Great Sphinx. Here, you do see erosion, but it is of the horizontal type. And this is the type of erosion that you would expect with wind and sand grinding. But there are certainly not these vertical grooves that you see on the enclosure wall around the Sphinx. And so this becomes part of the negative control in Robert Schock's argument.
is it possible that perhaps these other structures were not eroded in the same way as the swings and the enclosure wall because those structures were cut from a different type of rock? Well, this is an argument that was raised by Mark Lehner. And even though Robert Schock has an answer for that, I think it is still a mute point because if you look at other tombs further down the hill, so here's, for example, the Rocca tomb of Cai, and when you look at uh, the, the, the rock layer, This to, of this mastaba, they are actually very much comparable to the different rock layers of from which the Great Sphinx is made, and so you have a pretty good match here between the rock types. But nevertheless, even the tomb of Kai is not eroded the same way as the Sphinx and the enclosure wall, because again, you don't see the vertical erosion, but you certainly do see the horizontal erosions here, and so I think. Structures like the Mastaba of Kai that are a little bit further down the hill in the central field serve as a valid negative control for Robert Schock's argument that the enclosure wall around the Sphinx and the Sphinx itself are really unique in terms of their erosion pattern and that you cannot say that they were made at the same time as these other structures. To get a better feel for how the rock layers affect the argument, I have drawn the general direction of the sweep from higher to lower levels on the slide. So to get oriented, this is west, this is north, and as you can see, there are two general directions from the north to the south, higher levels to lower levels, and from the west to the east, again, higher levels to lower levels. Here is the tomb of Debehen, here is the tomb of Kai. And as a result of the sweep of these two vectors, the overall sweep is from the northwest to the southeast. This becomes very important when you interpret the seismic refraction data that were collected by Thomas Dubecki and Robert Schock to date the decay of the rock, not only above ground, which is the water erosion hypothesis, but also below ground once the rock is cut. What Dubecki and Schock were able to do with this carefully designed seismic refraction experiment is to separate the underground rock decay signal from the sweep down of the rock layers. They were able to conclude that the ditch around the Great Sphinx was cut thousands of years before the time of Khafre, and Robert Schock since has dated this to around 10,000 BC. And so I would like to summarize this part of my talk, pointing out that the original debate about the age of the Great Sphinx was really an internal debate. It was much simpler. It was Egyptology versus Egyptology. But the principal reason why the debate reignited is because new evidence from other disciplines like geology and astronomy was now being held up against evidence from Egyptology. And also, a lot more people are now involved in the debate. We have both academics and non-academics. And what the Egyptologists responded to that was basically the criticism that these other disciplines, these other scholars, are not paying attention to the Egyptological evidence. They're only looking at the Sphinx from their point of view, from astronomy and from geology, but they're not looking at the Sphinx from their point of view. And that's, of course, understandable. But I want to point out that there is evidence from the Egyptological side, archaeological evidence, that has not been examined to its fullest degree. And that is really the main message of the talk today, because what I'm going to show you now is evidence that does come from Egyptology. This is evidence that the archaeologists, the Egyptologists themselves, have found. So here are some of the protagonists in the Sphinx debate part two, which started in the early 1990s. Now, this is Zahir Was. He was the former Minister of Antiquities and supervisor at the Giza Plateau. Then there is uh, Mark Lehner, who studied 
surveyed the Sphinx extensively as part of his uh, thesis project. On the other side, John Anthony West, who um, regretted passed away three years ago. He was an independent scholar that went to Egypt, among other things, to prove that the Great Sphinx was much older than historians were telling us. And he's the one who brought Robert Schock to Egypt. Robert Schock, geologist from Boston University, went to the Sphinx with a skeptical mind. But when he left Egypt, he realized that there's something wrong with the narrative of history that says that the Great Sphinx was made in the Old Kingdom. So now I want to go back to what I was saying at the beginning of the talk, um, that in order to make history, you have to have a name. And this is really an Egyptological problem, because if you want to date the Sphinx to an earlier time, then the best proof you can think of is a written reference, something like an inscription or an image that dates this monument to an earlier time than what historians are telling us. This is the question that I asked myself in 2017, and that's really the beginning of my involvement. But before me, others asked the same question. For example, Robert Bouval, who investigated this very same problem. The problem is that the greatest statue in the world did not appear to have an unequivocal name, even in the Old Kingdom, when Egyptologists tell us that she was made. But it gets stranger. All of a sudden, in the New Kingdom, she does now not have only one name, but two. And here's the proof. On the Dream Stella, which I showed you before, in the second register, we see the following inscription. Living statue of Horachti. This is the falcon sign. Here's the two land signs. So this means Horachti, and right behind that name, we can see a sphinx on a pedestal. So there's no doubt that the name Horachti refers to the sphinx. The other name for the great sphinx, which we can see in the sixth register, is Horem Achet. Horem Achet by Zokar in Rostau. So again, this was a clear reference to Giza and there can be no doubt that Horm Achet, just like Horachti, was referring to the Great Sphinx. So here now we have suddenly two names, both of them, for the Great Sphinx. And so Robert Bouval asked himself, is it perhaps possible that we have two names because they're really two entities instead of one? And the reason why Robert thought about that is because Horem Achet, which means Horos in the horizon, is slightly different from Horachti, which means Horos off the horizon. And so what Robert did is to look at Old Kingdom inscriptions to see if he could find a reference to either one of these two names. And for that, he went to the pyramid texts. And the oldest pyramid text can be found in the Pyramid of Unas. And while scouring to the pyramid text, Robert Bouval made an interesting discovery. What he found is that the star spirit of the dead king didn't just travel with the summer sun at the time of the inundation of the Nile, but also with Horachti. And when you look to the sky to see where that is, you find the constellation Leo. And so Robert Bouval concluded that the reason why there were two names on the Dream Stella, slightly different names, Horachti and Horemachet, is because they referred to two different entities. Horemachet was the name of the Sphinx on the ground at Giza, but Horachti was the name of the Sphinx in the sky. And Bouval concluded that that had to be the constellation Leo. And so Horachti was the name of the Sphinx in the Old Kingdom.
the next question to ask is if indeed there was a statue before the great sphinx what was its name was it perhaps Horachti? but this is the problem because Horachti is mentioned in the pyramid texts and the earliest version of the pyramid text dates to unas who was alive about 150 years after kafre so maybe there was an inscription mentioning Horachti before kafre and it just hasn't been discovered but we're still left with this problem the challenge that egyptologists are holding up to the alternative camp they're saying give us some egyptological evidence is there anything that comes from egyptology from archaeology that says that there was a statue and is there a name and the answer to that question is yes there is And this really marks my entry into this debate. At the time, in 2017, I was researching this man, Hemi Unu. He was uh, a vizier on the Khufu. He was certainly alive before Kafre and before the mainstream narrative of the Great Sphinx. He was a presumed architect of the Great Pyramid. And so I was interested in finding out if there were any inscriptions or any evidence in his tomb that he master planned the three Giza pyramids. But I found something else that was very interesting. The pedestal of Hemiuno's famous statue, you see inscriptions that describe the different degrees that Hemiuno had. And Egyptologists have been able to translate almost all of these, these titles except for one. And this one title is here. In the lower pane right next to the left foot of Hemiunu is part of a dual title and it is this particular title that at the time had no translation. This particular title is part of a tandem set of two titles that was very exclusive in ancient Egypt. There's really only five people that are known to ever have carried this title. This untranslated title has three symbols. It has an axe symbol, it has the symbol of a bent rod, and it has a symbol of a couchant lion. Well, the axe symbol is a real object that you can find in the Cairo Museum. Egyptologists were certainly able to translate the axe symbol. The Egyptian word for it is meje, and the English word is master. And so the first part of this tandem set of titles translates into master of the royal scribes. But what about this symbol, the bent rod? Well, this symbol did not have a translation because that is not even an Egyptian hieroglyph. And on top of that, the lion symbol also did not have a translation, and so this is why this second title remained untranslated, even though the axe symbol also most likely meant master. Since the axe symbol represented a real object, I thought maybe the bent rod also was something physical, a real object. One possibility is the sky. And so if you look at the constellation Leo in high resolution astrophotography, this is a photo taken by Andrea Scuderi for me a couple of years ago. You can, in fact, see something that looks like the bent rod sign. And this appears above the back of the constellation Leo. Even though the bend is going the opposite way, this at least was one possibility that the bent rod was something that ancient observers saw in the sky. But there are other clues as to what this title means. And they come from the stone plate of a man that was buried also in Giza and was probably alive at the same time as Himiunu, certainly before Kafre and before the Great Sphinx was made. And this is the stunning tomb stela of weapon Nofred. And just like in the case of the pedestal from the statue of Himiunu, the titles are listed 
in a nicely organized manner. And here, for example, in this column, we see the academic titles. And the reason why they're called academic is because Repimnofred was a king's scribe. And it turns out here we have the tandem title with the untranslated title over here. Here again, master of the royal scribes. And now we can certainly see that the lions, uh, the sitting lion is in fact a lioness. But the other thing that we can see is a very important context that this particular column develops for us because here is the symbol of Seshat, the goddess of astronomy and archiving. And Repem Nofret was a priest of Seshat. And Seshat was the foremost in the house of royal knowledge. And so here we have a reference to a library. The context, therefore, that we have is one of scribing, of writing, and of archiving. And this is the context that frames this untranslated title. But in addition to that, we also now have a name for the lion, the lioness rather, and it is over here where this, the name is spelled just above the sign of the lioness, and it is Mahit. Who was Mahit? Well, Mahit is one of Egypt's oldest goddesses. She appears at the very beginning of Egyptian civilization. She was represented by a lioness with neck rings and bent rods above her back. She guarded a shrine, an animal shrine, that is called Per Ur, usually associated with Upper Egypt, that is Southern Egypt, but that does not mean that Mahid comes from the south, and I explain this in my book Under the Sphinx. In later inscriptions, uh, Mehit is consorted by Anhur or Anuris in Greek. There's a myth that um, describes how Mehit escapes from Anuris and he hunts after her and brings her back. And in Under the Sphinx, I explain that this is actually based on astronomy and particularly procession. The other associations of Mehit are that with the eye of the sun god, Ra, which refers to the moon. There are associations that have to do with flooding, for example, the inundation, but also the great flood. And the cubit, based on the forearm and the hand, that was, of course, used to measure floods. And then there was an interesting association with ancient. So even to the ancient Egyptians, there was a concept of something that was ancient to them. And that word, was somehow related to this concept of the lioness, of Mehid. The name for them meant something very old. And so now we have one piece of the puzzle to translate this strange title. So we have the master of something that relates to the lioness goddess Mehid. But we still are missing the meaning of this symbol, the symbol of the bent rod. Another clue can be seen on this stunning wood panel by Hesi Ra. This is a tomb from Saqqara. Hesi Ra was an official in the third dynasty about 150 years before Kafra. And here you can see something important, namely that the bent rod is not attached to the axe, but certainly to the lioness. And so what that meant is that whatever this object is, it is not really related to the idea of being a master, but it is related to the idea of the lioness Mahit. The most important question for me at this time was, is this a real object? Well, it turns out there are objects in ancient Egypt from the time of the Old Kingdom that are shaped just the same way as the bent rod. And so this meant to me that probably, yes, the bent rod above the lioness was a symbol that depicted a real object, not some kind of abstract idea. And so my original idea 
in 2017 is that the bent rod was maybe a key. And what that means is that a key to the lioness doesn't really make sense, but what if the lioness was not a lioness, but a building in the shape of a lioness? And I came up with this idea before I had studied keys and locks in ancient Egypt. Well, it turns out that the ancient Egyptians did in fact have locks and they used keys to open them. And some of these keys sort of look like the bent rod. So I felt like maybe I was on the right track and that the bent rod was in fact a key. But if that's the case, then the lioness could not have possibly been a real animal. And it could not have been some abstract idea of a goddess, but it had to be a physical entity that you can enter with a key. How would such a key work? Well, this is the idea. You basically have something that's bent and it pushes the pins into their sockets that are preventing the bolt from moving sideways. Well, I wanted to know if, based on this locking mechanism, you could build a lock that would open with a, an object that looks like this bent rod. And so I made this locking model, and it turns out that, yes, you can, in fact, build a lock that would open with such an object. Besides a key, there is another related possibility, and this comes from a reconstruction by Ludwig Borchardt of a door handle that was used to open a side door of the Valley Temple of King Sahura. This is a king uh, from the fifth dynasty in the Old Kingdom. And so when you look at uh, this mechanism that Borchardt reconstructed, you can see in fact a structure, uh, a door handle that is, that looks in some ways like this bent rod. And so to me that meant that maybe there is another possibility here that the object represented a key, but it could also have been a door opener. And so now we are one more step closer to being able to translate this title, which appears to be telling us that uh, these high officials were the masters of the key or the opener to Mahit. And the next step in the investigation was to identify the location, the place where this entity Mahit, if she was a real entity, a physical entity, was located. And to do that, I had to look for inscriptions where she was mentioned by name. And such inscriptions can be found on ceilings that are basically imprinted seals uh, on these clay stoppers that are used to secure jars and pots that had precious goods destined for the king. And on one such ceiling, this one is dated to the time of Horus Jerigen, the third king of the first dynasty, about 30th century BC, we see the lioness with the bent rod, three bent rods in this case, coming out of the back. We see an animal shrine here. We see a symbol on this side, several symbols on that side. And so the challenge now was to be able to translate these symbols in order to identify the context so that we could identify the location for this lioness. So how do we translate the symbol? Well, it turns out that this symbol here is the sign for the cardinal direction east. And so what that means is that the lioness is facing due east, just like the Great Sphinx. In addition, there is a symbol that refers to the delta, the northern aspect, basically lower Egypt, and that also locates the lioness to that part of Egypt and not the south, as I mentioned before. Now, the other symbols here can be literally translated into something that sounds like hem, het. And so I think what was going on is that in the early kingdom, there was no symbol that encoded the letters M and H together as meh. And so I think 
this sign hem was instead used to spell out the name of the lioness, Mahid. Now, the animal shrine here could be interpreted as a jackal sitting on a pedestal, and that also is a symbol that can be translated here as he who is over the secrets. The symbol here behind the animal shrine is the sound has a sound value of stau, and that is the word for caves. But there's another possibility for this animal shrine, and this is much more likely actually than he who is over the secrets, and that is the great hall, Per Ur. That turns out is the upper Egyptian shrine in the shape of the administrative building uh, of southern Egypt. And what that symbol is doing on this particular ceiling, I think, and I explain this in the book, is that this was a provisional facility made in the likeness of its original from Upper Egypt, and Mehid was guarding it. We know the name of this animal shrine because it is mentioned as early as the Third Dynasty to be Per Ware or Per Ur, either way. It was a shrine of Egyptian kingship from its earliest history because it can be seen on in er the earliest written records of the kingdom. It probably stood in its original form in Upper Egypt, but on the ceiling I just showed you, that is probably a provisional facility made to look like the original, and that provisional facility was in Lower Egypt at Giza, guarded by Mahid. It was in the shape of an animal, and that animal was probably an elephant. It was the site of the royal administration, and it was the place where the king housed his personal scribes. They were the early bureaucrats that wrote for the king, that accounted for the king, and that probably archived these records in that facility. But what about this symbol? Where have we seen this symbol before? Well, this symbol, as I said, means stau, and that refers to caves. But what is stau? Well, if stau means caves, then rostau was the mouth or the gate to the caves, and that, of course, refers to Giza. But there's even more proof that Mehid ultimately was a real physical statue at Giza, and that has to do with the neck rings. In this photo, for example, you can see a hint of a neck ring on the Great Sphinx, but that is because the neck was remodeled and fixed in the 1920s. But when you look at original photos of the Great Sphinx, like here, for example, you can clearly see at least one ring wrapping around the neck of the Great Sphinx. And so whether that ring was intentionally made or it is the result of erosion doesn't really matter. It just means that there is visually a connection between the neck rings on Mahid and this feature on the Great Sphinx. And so we have several different pieces of evidence that all point to a location at Giza for Mahid. And so together with uh, Robert Schock and Robert Bouval, I presented the, this cumulative evidence for a statue prior to the Great Sphinx in this paper where we interpreted the tandem title to mean the king's chief librarian and guardian of the royal archives of Mahit. And since this was at that time still an unidentified symbol, we decided to give it a name, and we called it the jaw sign to honor the life's work of John Anthony West. But this is not the end of the story, because after this paper was published sometime later, I found new evidence that significantly helped me to finally 
put to rest the riddle surrounding this object. So even though the bent rod symbol is not an Egyptian hieroglyph, nevertheless you can see it in association with another symbol, this winged disc symbol that is in fact a hieroglyph and this sign has three potential meanings and one of those meanings makes the most sense in this particular context which are pots that Petrie found in the royal tombs. And so this particular meaning has to do with oil. It turns out that these were probably shipments of oil from the north to the south and it's a form of a tribute, a form of a tax. And so I thought to myself, well if this designates oil inside of the jar that this was painted on, then this other symbol, the bent rod, the jaw sign in other words, may have designated the location where that oil came from. So if you then ask where was oil produced in that time in ancient Egypt, it turns out that was in Bubastis. Bubastis is in the delta in northern Egypt. But Bubastis is a Greek name. The ancient Egyptian name for that city was Baset the place of the soul or the soul of the place. But another name for place, the Egyptian word set, is the Egyptian word bu. And so it is possible that the symbol was meant to represent the sound babu, which would have told the recipients of the shipment that the oil came from Baset. And so you can think of this set of two symbols, one of them foreign and one of them domestic, has a form of a shipping label to designate what was in the jar and where it came from. And so then I asked myself, why did the sender of these jars from northern Egypt make a shipping label using a hieroglyphic sign and another symbol, the jaw sign, that was foreign? But I think the reason is because the sound of that sign was recognizable by the recipient in southern Egypt. Maybe not the meaning, but the sound of the sign. And that sound was probably something like Babu or Buba, which would have told the southern Egyptian recipient that this came from Baset, Bubastis. Now there are some historians who think that there was a connection between northern Egypt in prehistoric times and ancient Sumer. And so what I did is ask myself, is there a word babu or buba in the ancient Sumerian language? And I have to tell you, admittedly, this was a long shot. I did not know what to expect and in fact, I thought this was going to be a dead end street, but just on the contrary, this ended up becoming a huge surprise because it turns out that uh, not only does Ga Babu, the combination basically of the winged disc and the bent rod, the jaw sign means to bend, which of course reminds you of the shape of the bent rod, but also the word Babu means opening and doorway or door and gate and that of course is exactly what I had suspected that this is either a key or a door opener and so here we have a Sumerian word that means one thing opener and the sound of that word in Sumerian and probably also in prehistoric northern Egypt was babu and because of the sound that symbol was used in in this context of a shipping label to designate the city of Baset, not because that symbol had anything to do with that city, but the sound of that symbol had something to do with the sound of the word of that city. Now, if there's any lingering doubts, they are completely blown away by Pyramid Text 684 because there we see a word that's an Egyptian word spelled Gabu and of course that sounds just like Gababu and in fact it means the same thing it means bending curving and winding because it is used here in the context of 
the Mer and Ha, which is the winding waterway. And so now I had a confirmation that the combination of these two symbols phonetically meant exactly what the shape of this opener called Babu was, namely a bent rod. And so to summarize all of this is we do in fact now know that the jaw sign was a key or an opener and that means that Mahid was in fact a building in the shape of a line. And because we have an icon that tells us that such a creature is guarding above a facility that was used to scribe for the king and archive the documents, we can now say that what the ceiling is telling us here is that this was a royal archive that was secured by a lioness statue and this was located in Giza. And so that is how I would amend George Reisner's solution to the riddle of the Sphinx. Let me show you how old these symbols really are and this whole idea. Because here is another ceiling, also dated to the First Dynasty. We have Mahit with the jaw sign, Babu. And here is the shrine again uh, of the Great Hall. But what do we have underneath in this case? We have a double-headed snake. And so this is what the double-headed snake designates. It's really a boat. Uh, but this is a special boat in the afterlife of the spirit of the sun god after passing in the west and now being dragged here across the netherworld in order to resurrect and then re-arise in the east. And we see the spirit of the sun god here in the shape of Khanum under this cabin. And here is another scene from the same tomb where we see the same boat again showing the sun god spirit now floating above the double-headed sphinx and this is the god Aker, Aker. So the question is can we connect this animal shrine that we see on these various Mahit ceilings with Giza? And I think we can because this particular ceiling I just showed you has these two snakes underneath and as I also just showed you is that that is a boat. So when we now go back to the dream stealer and we look at the two sphinxes back to back just like the god Acre on which this boat is floating, we can see when you look carefully in fact the two tails and they appear to be in a cryptic way so to speak the boat on which the sun god is floating and there's a further confirmation of that if you look again at the cabin well that seems to be here the cartouche and even the sun symbol is right under it and so I think what we're looking at here is a cryptic sort of way to depict exactly the same idea namely that of a boat of a chimeric snake that is carrying the sun god and in the ceiling what is above the two snakes, of course, is the animal shrine, the facility of scribing and archiving. And that is exactly what we have now here underneath, because the two sphinxes are guarding exactly that, an underground facility that looks like a building. And so based on that, I would say the dream stealer is telling us that the great sphinx is guarding still something underneath. And that underneath is what's shown in the Mahit ceilings as the Great Hall Shrine to indicate that that was originally a provisional facility that was at Giza. But in reality, what we're really looking at here is an underground archive that was being guarded by Mahit. And so to show you that this is not a New Kingdom invention and it's not even something that comes from the old kingdom or even from the early dynasty here is a, a decorated pot from the pre-dynastic times and this dates 
to something like 3500 BC. So this is a thousand years before the time of Khafre. And we see exactly the same idea just expressed in a more simple way. We have a crescent shaped boat and we have the two cabins or pedestals or whatever you might want to call them. And then we have the ostrich sitting on top of the boat and in front. And the ostrich was the original symbol of regeneration. And of course, the feathers of the ostrich is what you see in the crown of Osiris, the god of resurrection that dwelled in the underworld at Giza to resurrect the dead spirit of the sun and the dead spirit of the kings and queens and later the dead spirits of the elites to come back to life. And so while I did not put a name on the image of this lioness from the tablet I showed you at the beginning of my talk, I am pretty confident at this point that what you're looking at here is in fact Mahit. The Great Sphinx and the time of Khafre certainly are not the beginning of a lion called in ancient Egypt. No, on the contrary, in fact, it turns out that lions were worshipped long before that time. So here, for example, is uh, a pot chart, a painted pot chart from the Wadi al Jarf. This photo is uh, courtesy of Pierre Talley. And what we see here are two symbols, and they translate into great lion. And so here, again, we have a reference from a time that predates the Great Sphinx, predates Khafre. And if you look at the image, the symbol here of a lion, again, we have what looks like a female lion. And, and this seems to be a statue because there are no hind legs. And so I think here again, we have more evidence that before the time of Khafre, there was a monumental lion statue at Giza. This is a Middle Kingdom statuette. Uh, it's about two feet long at the Cairo Museum. Um, even though this comes from the Middle Kingdom, but between the four paws, there's a name, and that name is the name of Khufu. So again, here now we have a reference potentially to the, to the time of the Old Kingdom. And if you want to know what the original Lioness monument, the Mahit monument, might have looked like. I think this is the closest we're ever going to get to knowing what that would have looked like. And it would have been perhaps something like this. So here is a summary of the new discoveries. The lioness was associated with writing and the securing of archives. Her name was Mehit, and she was in Giza long before the Fourth Dynasty and long before the Great Sphinx. So, but let me show you some more evidence that connects Mehit to the idea of an archive and, in fact, the idea of an underground archive. So, here, for example, we have two ceilings with Mehit here above, again with the three jaw signs, and look what we have here under the animal shrine. So here, this appears to be a square structure underneath the animal shrine, and there's some kind of access to it. And this could be stairs or some kind of corridor. So here we have a hint again that there is something underground associated with Mahit. But now if you look at another ceiling, this is a very unique ceiling because this one has a satchel, this is Petrie's interpretation, a satchel that was used to carry papyrus scrolls in it. And so here, this is probably a way to refer to an archive, basically a collection of writings. But now if we talk about an, an archive, an underground archive guarded by a monumental lioness, then we are getting to the Hall of Records. So the Hall of Records is a term that was popularized by Edgar Case. He was a psychic, he was a healer, alive in the early part of the 20th century. And 
among the many readings that Edgar Cayce gave to his clients, to his patients, there were a few that had to do with ancient Egypt. And so let's look at one of these readings in which Edgar Cayce referred to the Hall of Records or something like the Hall of Records. This is an early reading from 1933. And there um, Cayce was referring to record chambers in the plural uh, and a sealed room of records. And what he said in this reading is that this, meaning this room of records, in position lies as the sun rises from the waters, the line of the shadow or light falls between the paws of the Sphinx that was later set as the sentinel or guard and which may not be entered from the connecting chambers from the Sphinx's paw, the right paw that is, until the time has been fulfilled when the changes must be active in this sphere of man's experience between then the Sphinx and the river. So what does this mean? Well, first of all, the most important part of this is that Edgar Cayce predicted that this room of records is still sealed. The other thing is that he thought that there is an entry between the paws of the Sphinx, and he called it here a connecting chamber or connecting chambers that would lead to this sealed room of records. So what is under the Sphinx in terms of what Edgar Cayce thought is perhaps the entryway or the access corridor or the gate that would eventually lead to the Hall of Records. But I want to show you now some written evidence that should prove that Edgar Cayce is not the first one who spoke of a Hall of Records. And as a matter of fact, the first mention of such a place was not in modern times, not even antiquity, no. This comes to us from the ancient Egyptians themselves. So here, for example, we have an inscription that is dated to either the 19th or the 20th dynasty. So this is something like 11 to 1300 BC. And in this papyrus, this is the um, P501 papyrus Harris, magical papyrus. And what we read there is a will hath been done into writing by the Lord of Chemenu, and that's Thoth, the scribe of the library of Ra Harmarchus in the hall of the divine house or temple of Anu, which is Heliopolis, established, perfected, and made permanent in hieroglyphs under the feet of Ra Harmarchus, and he shall transmit it to the son of his son forever and ever. So what does this mean? Well, we have here a reference to written records in hieroglyphic, by Thoth, the god of writing, and stored in a library that is under the feet of Ra Harmarchus. Well, who is Ra Harmarchus? Well, it turns out that Harmarchus is just a Greek way to refer to Horamachet. And Horamachet, we know from the Dream Stealer, was the Great Sphinx. And so what you have here is an explicit reference to uh, a records hall, an archive, so to speak, which contains documents composed by the god of writing himself, and they are stored under the feet of the Great Sphinx. Well, let's take Edgar Case and the unknown composer of this papyrus by their respective words and ask, is there a connection chamber or a hall of records under the feet of the Great Sphinx. And so it turns out that there is actually a void under the left paw of the Great Sphinx, and this was seismically detected by Thomas de Becky and Robert Schock in 1990. And this is the only place around the Sphinx that really has not been probed yet with a drill. There is a drill that was conducted very close to this area, but it did not actually enter this particular zone where the two researchers detected this void. And so this particular drill was documented in a video that is uh, on YouTube on the internet. And as you can see here, the distance from the tips of the left paw is approximately three meters. But there's no 
way that this drill would have hit uh, this uh, chamber or void, natural cave, whatever it is, that uh, Thomas de Becky and Robert Schock found. Even the angle of this drill, which looks approximately 45 degrees, it would have been too shallow to be able to hit this void, even if it extended past the tips of the left forepaw. But so even if we could drill into Anomaly A, I don't think we would find anything in it. Um, and the reason is because there is an inscription from the first dynasty from approximately 2900 BC that tells us of the opening of an archive. And I have to remind you that these type of oil tags recorded a special event in a particular year. And so this was a year defining event. And this one in particular comes from, again, the, probably the reign of Horus Jair. And when we translate these symbols, um, it reads as up set of debt. And what does that mean? Well, it means open place archive. So here we have a reference um, that apparently was a, a year defining event in the reign of this king. And it records the opening of an archive. Well, now you might ask, well, how do you know that this word archive of dead refers to an archive in Giza under Mehit? Well, the answer to that question is that this word of dead is used in the coffin text extensively and it designates the mythical archive from which the sun god created, for example, the world. But this word is synonymous with another word that is referring to a physical archive. And um, that word is called under the arm. And so here now we have a very nice linguistic connection between something that is used in a mythical context with something that's used in a real context. And that real context is in fact something that is under the arm. And so that again is good evidence that we are talking about an archive that is underground and above is a statue and under the feet of that statue is this particular archive. And so you might ask, well, if this archive was breached, then what happened to the content that was inside? And in Under the Sphinx, I describe where this content, or at least some of it, may have ended up. And so here, this takes you to uh, a cemetery in Middle Egypt called Deir el Berche. And this was the location of an elite cemetery in the Middle Kingdom, where uh, the upper echelon, so to speak, the upper elite of that local society were obtaining special inscriptions on their coffins so that they, just like the king's centuries prior, would be able to survive the trials and tribulations of the afterlife and attain immortality. And on one of these coffins that was discovered in, in the tomb of a general is this painting here. And I can tell you there's no other examples of it in, entire, in all of Egypt at any time. Uh, there's something very unusual about this painting. It shows the sun god facing the viewer directly. And this is very unusual for a depiction of a god, especially of the sun god. And surrounding this god are nine bands. And so in Under the Sphinx, I explain what this painting means. What does it designate? Well, it ends up having to do with astronomy. And it is of the type of astronomy that the ancient Egyptians could not possibly have known. And so here we have a suspect for something that may have leaked, that may have come out of this archive originally. And then it was transferred to another place called the House of Life. That was an archive that um, had special esoteric knowledge. And we know this from other inscriptions. And in this particular place at Deir el Berche, some of this esoteric knowledge ended up leaking out and ended up in the, in the cemetery of the local elite. So here is another coffin uh, from the same cemetery, and it shows uh, something that's called the Book of Two Ways. The Book of Two Ways is 
uh, is an is a part of the entire corpus of the coffin texts and this book of two ways was inscribed and painted on the bottom of these coffins and here you see the map of the book of two ways and it turns out that this map is instrumental in uh, interpreting what this painting means and especially the bands that are surrounding the sun god And so we just learned that Thoth was the composer of these esoteric texts that ended up in the Hall of Records under the feet of the Great Sphinx. And so I want to show you another inscription where, again, we see this connection between Mehit and this whole idea of the Hall of Records. And so that comes from this particular ceiling. And on this ceiling, what we see is Mehit with a jaw sign that we now know how to recognize. And on this side is uh, the uh, heron symbol. And this spells um, the, the word achet. And achet, of course, means horizon. But there's another word hiding inside of this, and that is the word for Thoth, techi. Techi is an aspect of Thoth that has to do with architecture. And so here we see how, uh, again, how Thoth and Mehit are really very closely linked and in this particular connection for example you could think of architecture and the cubit which is the forearm and the name of that in Egyptian was May and of course the name of Mehit relates to the idea of the cubit and the forearm and now in the last few minutes um, of the talk I'm going to tell you about another discovery and this has to do now, not with the Hall of Records, but with the person that I think supervised the conversion of the Linus statue into the Great Sphinx. But not only that, this man was the last carrier of the Mehi title, and I think he was instrumental in naming the new statue Horachti, which is exactly what Robert Bouval had reconstructed from the pyramid texts. And this person was probably responsible for not only renaming the statue, but he was also responsible for creating a brand new cult that was associated with this brand new sta statue that was carved from a prior lioness monument. Let me introduce you to this man. Uh, his name uh, was Mary. And as you can see on this relief, he was a scribe. Uh, Mary most likely served under Khafre. He was buried in Saqqara, and that is where we find some inscriptions that are very instructive in terms of uh, this idea of creating a brand new cult uh, for the Great Sphinx that had just been formed, and also creating uh, brand new names for that new monument. So in order to explain this, I'm going to take you once more back to the Dream Stella, where, where we see two copies of the name Horem Achet, the name of the Sphinx on the ground. And I'd like you to pay attention to exactly how this is spelled, because this is going to become important in just a moment. So here is the falcon sign, and we have that on both sides. And then here is the symbol for M, which means in or from. And then here is the uh, horizon sign with the sun in the center. And so this means achet. So this whole sequence translates into hor, horos, in the horizon, hor, M, achet. And so what I'm going to do now is to take these two copies of this name of the Sphinx on the ground, and I'm going to... them first of all and then we're going to transpose them to another inscription and that inscription comes from the tomb of the man I just introduced you to and that is Mary and so here we have Mahit and on the other side we have the two falcons so the title with Mahit and the jaw sign you already have seen this before and it turns out that Mary, as I mentioned before, was the last person who carried this title. And this isn't a surprise because uh, 
if Mary witnessed the conversion of the Mahit statue into the Great Sphinx, then it isn't a surprise that a title that was associated with that prior statue actually ends up disappearing. And so here is probably the final example in, in the history of Egypt of this particular title with Mahit and the jaw sign. And this would date to the time of Khafre, exactly the time when the Great Sphinx was um, created from the prior statue. Here already we see a new version of a, the old title with the axe. It basically means the same thing, but uh, you can already see how the modernization is taking away the older title. And then when we go to the other side, look at now the two falcons this also is a title and it spells the two horses in the desert Heru, Herui I'm Chasti but from this title in a very interesting way you can actually derive both names of the great sphinx as we see on the dream stellar so here for example is Heru Achdi, and of course Heru Ach, when basically you're reading this anagrammatically backwards, Ach T, and that gives us Horachdi, and that is the name of the Great Sphinx in the Old Kingdom, as per Robert Bouval's reconstructions from the pyramid texts. So here we potentially have the the origin of this name from this title of the very same person who is the last carrier of the Mehi title and who probably supervised or witnessed the conversion of the Mahit statue into the Great Sphinx. But not only that, we also have the other name that comes out of this title, phonetically, I'm saying, uh, and that is Heru M. Achet, Heru M. Achet. And so we have both names, Horachti and Horem Achet. So I think now we have filled the gap between what came before Kafre and what came after Kafre. And I think we also have now good evidence that it was in fact under his reign that Mahid was converted into the Great Sphinx. Because it is at this time now that we see the Mahid title disappearance, we see Mary adopt a new scribal title, and then we see suddenly uh, this, this title, which is by the way only used once as far as is known, and Mary is the only carrier who ever had this title of the two horses. And then we see how this title phonetically relates to the two names of the Great Sphinx. So that was a lot of information. Um, first of all, I want to thank you for your attendance. I, I would like to thank the organizers of Contact in the Desert for having me to give this presentation to you. I know you probably have a lot of questions and so I am going to be available after this talk for anything uh, that you might want to ask me. There's a couple of closing words um, I just want to uh, mention. Uh, so first of all, um, I want to reiterate once more that the evidence is really what dictates where you go when you research and your discoveries are sometimes serendipitous. They are not necessarily what you intended to find and very often in fact it's just the opposite it's something that you didn't mean to find and this unexpected finding is what will take you to a real discovery and the second thing i want to say is that when you look at uh, archaeological evidence um, i think the light in which you interpret this evidence is important because i did not go to egypt i did not dig up any of the evidence I showed you today. No, all of these pieces of evidence that I showed to you are available and have been available for the most part over a hundred years. And so that gives us an important lesson and that lesson is that our biases, the, the sort of preconceived notions that we have that sometimes get generated by authorities in our respective fields those biases sometimes influence us in 
terms of how we interpret evidence and when we are free of these biases and we strip these preconceived notions and sometimes we see the evidence in a completely different light and it adopts a completely different meaning. And so I'm going to close now. Again, thanks much. Thanks to Contact in the Desert and I'm open to questions.